our new experiences, our digital projects. So uh, in terms of uh, our item digitization, during the pandemic, our main goal, of course, uh, things were totally um, you know, different and uh, difficult for everybody during the pandemic. So the library uh, closed in March uh, 2020, and it was difficult for us to proceed with our services. But our main goal was to keep uh, providing the services, the services for the community. Before the pandemic, we did have a digitization plan for our uh, uh, rare materials. But after uh, the pandemic, we, uh, we make sure to expand and widen our uh, digitization plan in order to fulfill our uh, users uh, requests so uh, the uh, the process was is that we we keep received uh, requests from our patrons and uh, within two to three working days during the pandemic we send the item or the book or the archival file to our digitization team in order to make it available to the user so if the item is public domain or out of copyright we send the electronic item directly to the user if it is under copyright, then uh, we uh, we make the item available to the user within the library network. So the user have to book an appointment and he need to come to the library building in order to uh, browse the electronic file of that. So um, more or less, uh, we have a plan to digitize 150 books and archival materials every week. Uh, until now, 90% of our uh, heritage uh, collection is digitized and available online. Um, and um, 14, in, in a range of 14 million pages available on our digital repository, which I will, I will speak about in a minute. I can't get the freeze. Okay, one point. Okay, so uh, the main two uh, sections, the main two uh, main sections for our digitization process is the conservation lab and the digitization lab. We have a conservation lab where they can check the condition of the item before we send it to digitization. We have um, a high tech uh, number of machines that are doing our digitization for our rare materials in order to ensure not to harm uh, the damaged or the fragile items that we have. Now I'll talk about uh, two of our main uh, digital portals. Uh, one of them is the Qatar Digital Library. So the Qatar Digital Library uh, archive offers a, a massive uh, archival collection of manuscripts, maps, archival documents, photographs, and a huge collection of India office records that are related to the Gulf uh, history and also um, a number of collection of, uh, is, uh, related to Islamic region, and it make it available freely online for everyone who would like to navigate that. So you don't have to register, you don't have to have a membership, you can just access the website and browse the items there. So the Qatar Digital Library project started with a partnership with the British Library. So we signed an agreement in 2012 with them in order with a 10, per, a 10 years period with the three different phases. The aim was to digitize all the items that they have at the British Library related to the Gulf region and related to the Islamic history. Many of manuscripts that are on the British Library, you can find it available freely online on the digital library, plus uh, all the items related to the, Gulf, to the Gulf history and also a little bit wider to the Islamic uh, world history. Um, so uh, until now, the uh, collection that we have at Qatar Digital Library is uh, 2.4 million uh, items, plus 225 uh, expert articles. Um, the new um, phase, which is started on July 2022 until uh, December 2025, aim to add 670,000 more uh, pages of items, plus um, 70 more expert articles. So, um, I mean, the, the metadata is available in Arabic and English. The, uh, uh, the project has started with a uh, British Library uh, collection, but now the negotiations is uh, continue to add 
more uh, institutions and more archives who have collection about the Gulf history and the Islamic history, such as the Ottoman archives, the archives of Netherlands and others. Of course, there are a lot of um, challenges or difficulties such as the metadata schema, but the team working on this project are trying more or less to harmonize all the issues in order to make a better uh, browsing for the users who are using uh, the uh, this digital uh, archive. For more information about uh, QDL, you can Hi, Fries. Hello, I can't hear anything. To our uh, heritage library, uh, the uh, the collection or the item digitized goes uh, directly. Anything have been digitized uh, from our collection goes directly to the digital repository. We set the metadata on our database, which is uh, Sierra, and once the item is digitized, it's. Uh, uh, automatically goes to the digital repository. However, uh, some of the items are uh, under copyright. So if the item is public domain, you can find it uh, open access and you can browse it uh, on the website and you can also uh, find the uh, the subjects. Uh, you can uh, search by subject or by date or by geographical uh, uh, region. If the item is under copyright, uh, you will see the metadata, but it will be seen as embargoed. Uh, in this case, it's either the uh, the user contact us directly for the item, uh, or uh, maybe uh, what we can do is, you know, like uh, sometimes we just contact the publisher, ask them to give us uh, the permission to use, or uh, sometimes uh, we just send 10% of the book, which was uh, really let us, um, um, uh, you know, like provide it to the user. Okay. okay. Let me just, I need to open. Uh, sorry about that. I need to start the Mela Zoom. Yeah. Uh, um, it's the Zoom I got this. How can everyone else still be in the room if it crashed on our end? Because we have several problems. It goes to any of them as a host. Oh, yeah. I see. So we can keep the boot online until we join back again. Okay. So everybody else online? <laughs> That's the yeah, thing. We are cool. Not, we are not <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're back Re online. Reclaim, reclaim it. Reclaim it. I'll let you do the work. We can see you again. Great. We're back online. Yeah, we're back online. We had some technical issues, but hopefully we're fine now. So I'll be just. Shukran. Okay, so uh, I hope that you catch up of uh, our uh, digital repository um, uh, brief. So uh, moving on, I will just uh, give a quick um, uh, information about uh, our new uh, digital projects. One of them is the Family Archive Digital Projects. And I've been working on this project for like, since 2018. So uh, the idea of this project is to collect the special uh, collections owned by the families make it available online for whoever is interested about the family history, about the the, the country's history. Uh, the problem that we have, it's not a problem, but I mean, uh, in the Gulf region, uh, the families uh, uh, treat 
their items as private collections, so they cannot really uh, share it with anyone. So it's a little bit difficult to negotiate with the families in order to convince them to collaborate with us in order to have the items available online. So far, uh, I've, I'm working with uh, three families who are very cooperative to, uh, uh, to help us in this project. But the collection varied. One of the families provide us with uh, 115 collections or archival materials dated back to 1779, mixed of correspondences, passports, images, and some of the families provide us with the 12, 13 items. So the idea is that we collect these collections, uh, have it uh, digitized, add the metadata, rewrite the items, and make it available on our digital repository under the family name with, of course, analysis and the studying of the items. Um, uh, but still, I mean, um, we do need to uh, negotiate with the families and uh, about, you know, uh, many issues. For example, the consent form, how to clear our site as a library because we are not the owner of the uh, physical items and also the agreement that is signed with the family. And also the idea is to have uh, an oral history section of this uh, project. Uh, that we meet the family, uh, let them to have uh, some of uh, audio recording and also add it uh, with the uh, collection online uh, for, uh, for the users. The other digital project is the digital table project. And this is an uh, interactive uh, project that we thought that it will be an addition to our uh, rare materials or distinctive collection on the library. So the visitors of the library building or the exhibition area will have this interactive table inside the exhibition area, which will include different items than the one on display. Uh, the challenge was how to make it more appealing and interesting for the users. So uh, as our collection is about the uh, history of Islamic civilization, uh, we inspired uh, the uh, narrative of the digital table by Ibn Battuta Ajab uh, al-Asfar book. So we use one of our maps. Uh, we trace the uh, cities that was visited by Ibn Battuta. And once the user is click on the city, they will have uh, items divided by material type related to the uh, city that was visited by Ibn Battuta. And we will, add, we will add some of the narratives that more or less can combine uh, his experience and also some information about our collection that will be added on uh, the uh, interactive experience. Okay, very briefly, uh, I'll talk about our digital exhibitions. Beside the uh, uh, permanent exhibition we have, we uh, organize two temporary exhibitions every year. And the exhibition, temporary exhibition lasts for three months. So now the idea is to have the exhibition after the period is done, to have it as digital exhibition available online uh, for, uh, for the users and for uh, the public to, to browse it. So uh, some of the exhibitions, we did have it as a digital form. For example, the Arab cinema uh, poster exhibition, we do have a big collection of uh, cinema posters. So we make it, we have this interactivity along uh, screens, which we call totems. And some of the physical exhibitions, for example, the Arab American history exhibition or the photography exhibition, all of them after the, the end of the period of the uh, temporary exhibition, we have it in a digital form in our uh, website accessible for people who ever wanted to, uh, to navigate that. So in conclusion, I mean, the, uh, the main goal for us and uh, the distinctive collection at Qatar National Library is to have uh, to develop our digital experience for our materials and ensure variation. And we are very happy to collaborate and exchange ideas, uh, to exchange expertise and maybe, you know, like trainings um, uh, for, the ex for the digital experiences in order to make it more accessible to, to the users. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any uh, question, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mariam. Uh, now we'll move to um, stop sharing here. Let Jacob.
Now we we'll move to uh, Mark uh, from AUC. Mark is the director of the Center of Ex Excellence for Middle East, uh, the director of the Center of Excellence for the Middle East and Arab Cultures at AUC Libraries. And the Mark and the two of his students, Mina and Andrew, will uh, present on enhancing access to digital collections through computational tools. Mark, it's all yours. Sorry, thank you. Um, I'm just sharing my screen. Can you all see that? Yes. yes. Okay, fantastic. So, um, good morning, everyone. As um, pointed out, I'm at AUC, and I'd like to talk a little bit of enhancing access. Um, and it's good that this comes after the presentation of Qatar Digital Library, because, of course, it follows on a little bit from there. Um, we are creating digital collections, uh, all of us. And um, we all know that access to those digital collections is mostly predicated on good metadata. Now, the problem that we in particular, and I guess it's maybe some of you as well, face is that um, there's a certain limit on staff time available for processing the materials that comes in that's being put into digital collections. And particularly granular metadata, creating that is terribly work intensive. And so we reached out to the Department of Computer Science um, this uh, last semester asking whether they might have some uh, clever students who could help us with um, some clever tools that are, that are out there. And the chair of computer science very kindly agreed that he would recognize work for the library uh, uh, as credit for the industrial training requirement, which they have in the department. So this, this was sort of inter-campus um, collaboration and it was quite a successful one. We managed to recruit a very good group of uh, students in their mostly their third year and um, basically set them to task with a list of prompts that we had created. And those prompts um, were given as choices to the students. They selected what they thought um, looked interesting. They then formulated a kind of um, position paper or a kind of proposal, which was run by the department in order to get approval, pre-approval, uh, so they would get credit at the end of the course. And then they basically ran with it. Um, and what I wanted to share with you today is two tools in particular, um, both of which are designed to um, uh, enhance access to different parts of the collection. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew first, um, who was a student working on um, a project to do with face recognition, sorry, there we go. It was Andrew Zaki and Sharif Sakran. Andrew, please, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Andrew Zaki, working with Sharif Sakran, and I'm going to present face recognition to all of you. So our motivation is that the University Digital Archives contain large quantities of photographs related to AUC's history, and these images are used repeatedly for publicity and research, but few photographs carry a clear identification of the people depicted. Moreover, identification of people are often, uh, often incomplete. So our goal to, uh, is to facilitate the process of identification of any unknown, uh, of any known people inside the photographs. So our project idea is to introduce this club application that enables libra librarians to tag people and to create data sets of the tagged people automatically and to create metadata for the tagged people automatically. And finally, it, it will have the ability to automatically detect and identify already tagged people in other contexts. Uh, our system has two main features, to tag faces and to reg automatically recognize faces. So our, our first feature will be uh, the tagging, uh, tagging uh, faces. So in order to start with the applications, the desktop application, we need to create the environment. The environment is a, a specific uh, folder, which has, please next slide, a slide. Uh, the environment will have two folders. Uh, the, main, the most important one is the images uh, that you have to put all the images uh, inside it. Next slide, uh, as, as it appears in this slide. So after that, after uh, uploading all the images in, in, this, uh, in this folder, you can start working with the application. So the first feature is a tagging feature. You can uh, press this button and then, and then uh, you can choose any vector and then you, uh, you can like add 
all the information you would like to associate uh, the photograph with the, uh, this information. So, for example, you can uh, add all the names, but you, you have to put, uh, separate the names with a semicolon. Uh, in addition to, you have to uh, put uh, all the names in the order uh, of the photographs, uh, like the faces, X1, X2, and so on. And for example, here I added the AUC residents for the uh, description. And then you can press save and you can find the faces will be labeled with the input names. For example, here, Francis Richardoni and Mr. Dallet. And after that, the, the metadata will be saved, uh, like associated the name of the, the photograph. Uh, and after that, underscore meta, metadata.csv. After that, it will be saved in the general CSV file, which have all the metadata of all the photographs that uh, were stacked before. Moving on to the next feature, which is automatic face recognition feature. Uh, you will have to press this button, which is recognize faces, and you will choose the folder of images, the wall folder. And it will uh, detect all the, uh, uh, the images. Uh, like uh, if you have tagged this uh, face before, uh, it, will, uh, it will automatically recognize it. Uh, as for our example, Mr. Chidoni and the, uh, Mr. Dalel uh, was previously tagged. So the, our system could uh, detect these faces. However, it couldn't detect the second face, which wasn't uh, tagged before. Next slide. And of course, after automatically uh, recognize these faces, it will save all the metadata in uh, uh, like a, meta, uh, a CSV file contain all these metadata and uh, add the entries of these metadata to the general CSV file. Uh, we try to challenge our system to, to have a low quality images. And after trying the, these low quality images, it worked for some faces, but it couldn't work for all the faces. For example, this baby or child, it couldn't work for him. So thank you. These are, uh, this is ends our, uh, my presentation. Thank you. All right. So that was uh, one uh, project of the students. And um, I'd like to show um, the next year uh, project, which uh, is to do with page segmentation. Um, Mina, do you want to take it over from here? Yes. Um, good morning, good morning. Um, so for the second project, we were working on page segmentation on old Arabic magazines. We were a team of three undergraduate students, uh, Ahmed Fathi, Mina, and Nirmin al -Ausi. So uh, briefly, we'll talk about the problem, uh, our solution, its impact, and future additions that can be done on it. So our aim is to make digital documents more accessible, but by gaining more accessibility to digital documents means also having more accessibility to what's in them. So in our problem, we were mainly concerned with images. Um, documents have images that are very valuable and to reach one image, we had to manually search through a huge amount of documents. Uh, but like there can be better ways to save time efforts like and make the images more searchable, um, and that is what we try to do. So to rephrase the problem, we were we were trying to extract images with their metadata uh, automatically from scanned old Arabic magazines. Um, how can we do so? Uh, we can use AI, but there's a problem with AI is that it's not always 100% accurate. So we created a tool that leverages both the power of AI with the reliability of a human user to make this process much faster and at the same time reliable. So in our tool, we have three main AI components, which is the first one, the image segmentation for extracting the image, um, OCR for reading the text on the image and image captioning to generate ma uh, automatic captions. But this last part is still under development. So the main two parts are the first two. Um, when it comes to the, the, the tool itself, here we can start from the uploading the pages. So we have scanned pages from uh, some magazine. Uh, we upload the images and after we upload it, we see the preview for this page and below it, we can see the metadata. And when we make sure uh, all is good, we click on show detections. When we show detections, um, the detections for, for each image 
in all the pages are shown and to make sure that these are all the images and there's nothing nothing left out um we click a button to show manual detections as we can see in the next slide so here we can see the detections made on each page and if there is a detection that wasn't made we can create a box for it and then return back to, to the detection that we made so this is a main overview of how we extract images uh, for more features on creating the metadata so we have the basic metadata for each image like the name of the magazine the issue date and the page which are shown under the page but there are also different options that we can use uh, the first one is, is generating ocr generating ocr reads the, the the text that's in the image and add it add it to the metadata so that can be more searchable um, we can see the image on the left is without ocr and the right has has uh, captions using the ocr so this was the first we can also add manual uh, captions so here we write al batar sagir mahmoud sirajuddin and when we submit it it is added to the captions of this image um after we refine our detections and uh, finalize our captions and metadata uh, we choose to download our detections in images and csv format or json format if we are dealing with an abi of some other application so this was a small demo for for our project uh, the impact of this project is, is that it will cut down searching time and the effort to extract a specific image from documents and we can make the images searchable and also it, it integrates ai into another crucial part of library system however there's a big room for improvement so we can improve the, uh, the tool by creating the or by making the image captioning better, which generates automatic captions, as we can see in the next slide. We can also expand the tool, uh, not only for old Arabic magazines, but for other domains. And uh, we can integrate it with other, with other tools and systems. And this was for our tool. Thanks for listening and thanks for your time. Right, so um, that was our presentation nutshell. I'd just like to stress that all these projects are sort of um, proof of concept projects. They're not um, meant to be final products. And I'm really hoping that uh, perhaps in the future we can get some grant money in order to take them forward and develop them a bit further to make them uh, more deployable, um, but also to make them, um, to integrate them with one another so that we've got a full pipeline uh, for digital content uh, where we can uh, move magazines and other uh, stuff that comes in through that pipeline and get a full set of tagged images. So um, I think we have questions at the end, so um, we'll leave it at that and um, I'm happy to hand over to the next presenter. The uh, the next presenters are um, <clears throat> Mariam Al Mutawa, no Mariam Khas, uh, Samar Al Miqati, who is the Associate University uh, Librarian for Archives and Special Collections at AUB, uh, joined by uh, Basma Shibani, uh, the Associate University Librarian for Cataloging and Metadata Services at AUB, also uh, Eli Al Kahle, um, the Director of Digital Scholarship and Initiatives at AUB. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be speaking about the, um, just one second to open the other. Uh, yes, the sir, safeguarding the um, ESA, just one second. The presentation will be... Collection of ESA Skandar Malu. ESA Skandar Malu, okay. Thank you. We'll take it from here somewhere. Thank you. Hello.
go ahead, Samar, please. Okay. Uh, you can share your screen. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, I, uh, can you see my screen? We can see it, yeah, but put it in the full presentation, please. Down to the right. Down to the right. Yes, down to the right. Yeah. The other one, the one next to it. Yes, that one. Oh, yes. There we go. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the title is Safeguarding the Isa Skandar Maluf Collection. Uh, just uh, I'm going to give a small overview of the university and the scholar. Uh, the Syrian, uh, the American University of Beirut was founded as the Syrian Protestant College in 1866 by American missionaries and uh, uh, during al -Nahda. After 50 years, uh, the name was changed into the American University of Beirut and uh, it uh, became a liberal art university. Uh, in this vibrant setting uh, of al, al -Nahda, uh, Isa Skandar al-Ma'luf was born to a, a cultured family, and he joined the, uh, an English school where he uh, later on he left it and learned several languages on his own. And then he founded the uh, uh, Nahda al Almiya Society, whose mission was to promote public uh, speaking. Malouf was an educator and a journalist, uh, and a linguist, uh, poet, public speaker, and a zealous uh, uh, manuscript and book collector. He traveled around the Arab world in order to collect this collection. Uh, of course, he was uh, the author of several books uh, in history, genealogy, uh, and uh, he uh, published several books, Dawani al Qutuf uh, and Tariq Zahli, Qasr al Azam fi Dimashq. Also, he published several articles in uh, very prominent uh, uh, publications of his time. Al Muhazab, Al Muqtataf, Al Hilal, and several uh, women publications like Al Mar Al Jadida and Fatat al Sharq. Uh, Malouf also was a founding member of several uh, literary and cultural societies in Lebanon, uh, uh, Cairo, uh, Brazil also. Uh, during the era uh, of Al Nahda, uh, Isa Skandar Al Malouf collected uh, a big collection of books. Uh, he bought them and uh, copied some of them and hold a salient collection of uh, medieval uh, and Islamic uh, manuscripts. And also uh, contemporary, uh, manuscripts of contemporary scholars from Palestine and, and the Middle East, uh, other parts of the Middle East. His uh, library was called uh, Al Khizan Al Malufiya, which was uh, supposed to be the Mecca of scholars. Every uh, scholar who passed by the uh, by Lebanon had to pass by this library and visit it. Uh, of course, this library was huge. It contained 1,200 manuscripts, 20,000 books in different topics and different subjects, uh, and he collected them from around the, the Arab countries. The, uh, the thing is that uh, the, uh, the AUB has uh, got this uh, uh, collection in two installments. Uh, the first two uh, do uh, donations of manuscripts were uh, received in late 19th century from the Syrian society and from the Naufal Naufal uh, libraries. But the Isa Ma'luf collection uh, in 1925, a delegation from AUB went to, to Bika in order to choose several of these collections. Later, after, after 90 years, AUB was lucky enough that the collection was still there in the Ma'luf family and uh, uh, we could uh, obtain it. And uh, uh, it was uh, passed from Isa Malouf to his son Riyadh and to his grandson. Uh, during that time, according to uh, Dr. Nadas Baiti, the collection was, uh, was available for researchers uh, for in Zahli for a fee. But what about uh, the new accession? After 90 years, of the first purchase in summer of 2015, the other larger and final portion of the library was, was acquired by AUB. Upon visiting the library, it was noticed that it was, although the material was well protected against insects with the poison scattered all over the room, but it was not well maintained and, not clear, and clearly not cleaned. Dust was abundant and several items suffered from 
some chemical and physical deterioration. The collection uh, uh, contained uh, thousands of uh, a thousand photographs, uh, 700 postcards, uh, uh, 400 manuscripts that range between the date 18th century to the 20th century. And they covered not only Isa Skandar al-Ma'loof's manuscripts, his relatives' manuscripts, but also the manuscripts of prominent contemporary uh, uh, scholars like Riz Allah al-Halabi, Mkhayil Mishya'a, Nasif al-Yazji, Nawfal Nawfal, and, uh, and many others. But what about the EAP 1323 that we are going to introduce today? In, in, in uh, 2021, the AUB libraries received a major grant from the British Library Endangered Archives Program, supported by the Arcadia Fund. The fund aimed to, uh, or the grant aimed to clean, repair, house in acid-free enclosures, and cat catalog and digitize the Isa Skandar al-Ma'loof. A hundred of these distinctive manuscripts were selected and uh, were uh, necessary for the study of cultural, social, and religious history of the Middle East. Uh, of course, they were stored for 60 years in uh, uh, a storage that was not uh, uh, يعني, good for them or uh, uh, in, a, in a neglected storage, but uh, now they are available in a special manuscript uh, environmentally controlled room. The AB, uh, uh, EAP project allowed the, uh, the addition, uh, uh, the availing, sorry, the availing of 100 manuscripts to be online and uh, available to uh, uh, other researchers. Now I give the floor to my colleague Basma Shibani, who's going to talk about the metadata of the material and how it was cataloged and what the, the difficulties they faced. Thank you, Samar, for your uh, introduction. Very nice and detailed uh, introduction. Uh, now let's uh, speak about uh, the uh, technical side of the project and uh, of the collection uh, as well. Uh, the, the manuscript, uh, 101 manuscript has been selected by uh, Samar and uh, a committee. Uh, this uh, manuscript uh, should be uh, uh, cataloged. So we started the, the cataloging uh, of this manuscript after the preservation made by uh, uh, Samar department, uh, because most, as she said, the most of them are, uh, uh, at, uh, has some uh, damage, uh, some, some damage in, inside the book and some in the binding. So it was, uh, uh, the, the collection has been, uh, uh, preserved, uh, well preserved, and uh, able to be digitized. Before digitization, we start the cataloging by uh, using uh, uh, the uh, RDA uh, uh, rules for cataloging and the rare book uh, uh, description also. And uh, we uh, we uh, stored the cataloging the data. Uh, uh, in uh, the, the Sierra digital uh, library system uh, in MARC uh, records. Uh, the, the MARC uh, records uh, are very rich. The, the catalog in MARC uh, records are very rich. We, uh, uh, in, uh, we added a lot of information about each uh, manuscript, uh, included the uh, uh, the number of uh, of line in a page, uh, the uh, color of the color of uh, uh, the ink and the type of ink, uh, the quality of uh, the script, uh, the information about the, the beginning of the manuscript and the end of the manuscript, insert and explicit, and uh, the colophon as well. Uh, information and we we use the, the subject headings the library of congress subject heading uh, in arabic because the, the, we catalog the arabic uh, coll arabic collection in arabic we and we add the transliteration 
for uh, uh, the for the fields of mar and uh, i mean romanization or transliteration uh, we also use uh, the uh, uh, decimal classification uh, we add also uh, the uh, also, uh, the link data ID uh, for, from the Library of Congress next to each author is if available. Uh, this is uh, in, inside our library systems here. Uh, usually we export the information from uh, the market record uh, and uh, to convert them and map them and convert them to any schema available mainly in Dublin Core to be populated in our digital repository or in the content management system. But for this uh, uh, collection, we we have to be to abide by the, uh, the by the uh, grant uh, by the British Library who provide us with a template, specific template uh, that fit the uh, schema of their digital repository. I'm not sure. But uh, what is the schema? But this is uh, uh, what uh, they ask us to to put the information in this uh, template. I will uh, uh, show you the template uh, in the next uh, slide. Uh, so the, uh, after uh, after the, uh, the 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 import uh, the metadata are now available uh, to be sent. To digitization, to the to LE department, uh, to uh, for digitization, and uh, I want to show you the a little bit about uh, the template, the field or the uh, elements of the template. Please, Samar, move uh, next one. This is the information of uh, uh, the manuscript. One of the manuscript. Uh, in uh, uh, Sierra, uh, uh, in Sierra uh, um, Opac, you can see how uh, how the details are very enriched in uh, uh, in uh, describing the uh, the manuscript. Uh, please uh, move. Basma, I just want to remind you that we have three minutes more. Yes. Okay. I finished. The, the, please turn it. This is the, uh, the template of uh, the British Library. It contains a lot of very detailed information about the title, about the, the, the uh, translated title and transliteration title, uh, language, uh, and uh, uh, date in Gregorian and in Hijri. In addition to the subject uh, provided, uh, uh, like a uh, controlled vocabulary, not the Library of Congress subject heading. Please uh, move. This is uh, this is the last uh, part of the template. You can see the digital uh, information about the digital copies uh, uh, that uh, uh, Eli and his staff uh, is uh, filling in this template to be later sent to uh, the uh, the British Library uh, for uh, downloading in their uh, digital repository. Uh, please turn. This is how it looks in uh, the in, uh, Intangent Archive uh, uh, program uh, of British Library. This is one of our, uh, uh, our uh, manuscripts. Thank you. Let I keep I uh, I uh, now uh, for a leave for more technical information about the digitization and preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Basma. Thank you, Samar. Hello, everyone. I'll promise I'll be as short as possible. Uh, at a university library, we consider uh, our digitization lab uh, as a hub for different digital scholarship and uh, digital initiative activity. We adopt international standard uh, and best practices for digitization. For us, digitizing uh, culture and artistic artifact is actually an art by itself and should be a space for creativity and collaboration. In this project, we follow the British Library and Digital Archive program standard to digitize the manuscript. 
Um, we also created our own derivatives from the digitized images to publish them on our own digital collection of platform. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the link to our digital collections. Uh, during this journey of building this uh, digital collection, uh, we had the chance to work on uh, different projects that can endorse actually different content types. We had images, text, but of course also we had videos and sound. Uh, we had to adopt and deploy systems that support international uh, standard and feature, for example, to allow harvesting of the metadata uh, to integrate uh, with the triple IF, uh, to be able to have uh, scalability, and of course, to be able to integrate with our digital preservation framework. Uh, next slide, please. And um, the AUB University Library started, uh, started with the need to digitize and preserve as much as possible of our library collection uh, and the need to give access to this material and primary sources uh, to as many resources and students um, by making them more accessible uh, and more visible. Um, and our uh, objective during this journey quickly shifted from only digitizing and preserving our own material to collaborate um, in the production and dissemination of, uh, of knowledge. However, I'm going to talk a little bit about digitization in exceptional circumstances. Uh, everybody knows about the pandemic, uh, which uh, affected globally. It made us shift our focus to assisting our students and scholars to digital pedagogy and other digital learning tools. Uh, another example related to our infrastructure nationwide, we faced severe electricity cut that made several physical collection and the primary resources at risk, mainly due to lack of climate control in the library building. Of course, this was accompanied by Beirut port explosion and severe economic crisis, people being laid off, others just quitting. In addition, we had unrest and riots going on in the region. So imagine you have to wake up in the morning in the middle of the summer with no electricity, and it starts uh, cleaning scattered glasses and the damage that happened from my wood port explosion while planning on how you can make sure to save your collection from mold or physical deterioration that are treasured for our institution and for the whole region. So next slide, next slide please. So despite all of this, we were successfully able to digitize and safeguard uh, our collection with the help of a fund from the British Library uh, that uh, provided us with practices and guidelines. We took this opportunity also to shift our digital collection platform to a new platform using Blacklight and Triple IF. Next slide, please. So this is our Triple uh, IF uh, version of this manuscript. Uh, next, uh, final slide, please. So I would like uh, to add that this opportunity actually opened the door to further collaboration with the uh, British Library. As, uh, as the University Library and AUB will be collaborating with the British Library on Digitization and Conversation Initiative uh, in the MENA region to save, uh, preserve, and give access to valuable archives at risk. Hopefully, we will release more information about this initiative uh, soon. Uh, final screen, final slide. Thank you. So, thank you, everyone. And if you want to contact further, these are our emails later on. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your great presentations. Uh, thank you, uh, Mariam, uh, Mark, and Andrew, Mina, uh, Basma, Samar, uh, and Eli for all the information that you gave today. We have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, so anyone want to ask questions online or in person, please go ahead and start. Uh Am I allowed to start to start to be the first one? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Okay, I'm uh, Ioana Feodorov right. from Bucharest, from the Romanian Academy. I am uh, leading a project that uh, is called Type Arabic and uh, working on material, early printed material from Lebanon and Syria, Aleppo, Beirut, and the Romanian principalities. And I have a very specific question. Um, Isa Alexander Ma'aluf uh, published in uh, Niama in uh, Haziran 1911, I'm looking at the page now, an article on uh, the uh, early printing in Arabic uh, called Matba'a Romania, Lurthodoxia, Arabia, Lantakia, 
which is a strange uh, title because it's not uh, exactly what happened. And uh, he was supposed to uh, have a second episode of this uh, article. So uh, he finishes by saying that he intends to continue this uh, to, to uh, publish something uh, more about the uh, books that he had in his collection and that he saw in other collections in uh, Lebanon that were printed in the 18th century in uh, the Romanian principalities in Aleppo and Beirut. Um, is it possible to find a manuscript maybe of his works that he didn't manage to, to publish? Uh, could we look for it uh, in case I contact you? Would you be so kind and see in his archive if there is anything left there that he he wanted to publish and didn't manage to finally? Uh, Frank, you. we will try our best. Of course, you are welcome to, to email us uh, and we will try our best to look for it. But the problem is that his library is huge we are processing it in installments. Uh, there is some research that's still not published. Uh, we have uh, uh, organized it alone, but we didn't start working on it. Uh, so why not? We can, we can look for it and uh, email us uh, the, the uh, material that you have already. And we'll take it from there and look for, for the material uh, in the hope that we can find the, the other published or unpublished uh, research, because he has a huge amount of material that's not uh, uh, published yet. Thank you, I will. And I also have two colleagues from, uh, three colleagues from Lebanon who are on the core team of our project. So mm -hmm. I will ask them to maybe visit you. And uh, uh, the good news is there, there is a personal archive, not only um, manuscripts that he collect, collected, I suspect he also has early printed books. I mean, yes, we could look certainly. for copies. Mm -hmm. he, had, he has a rich collection of uh, early printed books early uh, periodicals also. And he even had not only the famous periodicals, he had also very uh, localized uh, periodicals, newspapers from villages all around Lebanon and Syria that we have never encountered in any other collection. Thank you so How much of this will be uh, available online for research? How, how much? The, the good thing about it that we are doing this in installments, the, uh, this week, we are going to post a, a, a collection of catalogs that were published in uh, uh, libraries or presses around uh, Syria, Lebanon, and, uh, and Egypt that he had catalogs of. And we, have, we, done, we did a finding aid. We were not publishing the catalogs themselves, but a finding aid about these catalogs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thank Summer. Thank you. Other You're questions welcome. from online or in person? Yes, AJ. Hi, this is AJ from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I'd be interested to know more about, I mean, I can only begin to imagine the difficulties that power shortages have on a digitization project. Um, I'd love to hear more about that, how you were able to work with those difficulties and any other infrastructure issues that way that any of the teams have encountered. This is probably for Eli. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, definitely you cannot operate without electricity, but uh, actually it's, it doesn't only affect um, digitization process, actually it affects the material. For example, in our collection, we'll have a lot of microfilms uh, and even the manuscript, it should be in a, in a climate controlled room and because of the different uh, complex uh, aggregated uh, issues that we went through. So um, we, had, we had a problem and we started looking uh, uh, how we can digitize as much as possible, as fast as possible. Uh, but also with the economic crisis, this, uh, this wasn't easy. So this is why uh, we really appreciated working with the British Library where we got the fund and we started digitizing some of this material. And as uh, uh, we've been asked now, if we have more funds, we're ready to, to, to digitize as much as possible. Our policy is if we don't have copyrights, why don't uh, we publish and uh, give open access to, to these materials so that can everyone have access to them? 
but the problem is with the infrastructure and uh, being able to actually uh, safeguard all of this material uh, before we we get into other problems. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Other questions? We have time for one more question in person. I, yes, we have. I, I have a quick question, if possible. Okay, go ahead. Uh, hi, this question is for Summer for Basma. This is a fantastic collection. Um, I'm interested to see if you guys have done any survey on how much of the material is in Persian or Ottoman Turkish, and would that content ever be possible to be made available for people interested in the wi wider region? For, for uh, the the most of the uh, publications or the manuscripts are in Arabic. Uh, there are few Ottoman Turkish uh, and. Uh, uh, and especially for the old uh, collections, maybe there are more Ottoman Turkish, but mainly it's in Arabic. Mainly it's in Arabic, but covers uh, very diverse uh, subjects, uh, uh, religion, theology, uh, astronomy, astrology, uh, uh, you name it, and it's there. And we had difficulty uh, to choose the most appropriate subject because we tried to uh, be as diverse as possible. Uh, but of course, uh, you face it sometimes that you have to choose one uh, manuscript rather than the other because you find it rare, you find it unique uh, in order to avail it to, to researchers uh, all over the world. Uh, but the, the, the good thing about it is the, that the collection, it's not limited to manuscripts and early Arab print. It has uh, 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 photographs from late 19th century, early 20th century. It has postcards, early 20th century. It's really, and it has Isa's uh, personal research as I uh, indicated earlier. So it's really a diverse collection and very rich and we are trying our best to push uh, through it. And it has some calligraphy, if you, uh, if you can imagine some calligraphy of Najib Hawawini. Samar, there's a question in the chat saying, uh, how about Syriac? Syriac, uh, no, I don't think in Isa's Ma'luf, uh, collection, there is no Syriac. Uh, there is in another collection that's, uh, uh, what, what's uh, its name? Uh, there was the oldest manuscript in our collection is Syriac. It's the Beirut Codex. And there is uh, uh, in another collection that uh, we have not processed yet, Agula collection, there are some Syriac uh, uh, manuscripts. Great, thank you. We have another question here in the audience. Uh, this is Tom Kramer from Stanford University and the Digital Library of the Middle East Project. Uh, th this has been a fantastic panel, really wonderful collection of digital library resources and digital projects that are showing both breadth and depth. I'm wondering what you, maybe this is something for each of the panelists or if there's someone who has a really compelling vision, um, what would be the single greatest thing that could further digital library projects or digital humanities projects? And is it more content? Is it more tools? Is it better discovery, better description? I'm just wondering if you have a perspective on where could, how could we take things to the next level? I, I, th I think it's a combination of all of these. Yeah, and answer this question, whoever wants to go first. We have Mariam here too. Yeah, Mariam. You want to say something, Mariam? Just one second. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to highlight that uh, the most of the comments that we receive is the uh, searching uh, tool for these digital uh, archives. Sometimes it is difficult to find an item, uh, even if it is there. So uh, I think enhancing the, the search engine for these digital uh, archives would be very beneficial for the people who are using these. If I may... Uh... I guess what, uh, what smart team is doing using artificial intelligence is actually a great way to improve of things, how we can done with the archives to automate things as much as possible or semi automate them. And if, of course, uh, enhancing OCR where you can increase the search as Mariam just mentioned, uh, handwritten text is important and things are being done regarding this using AI. So this is my take on this, thank you. Mark, my, anything? My, my two cents worth is that uh, we have content galore. We've got millions and millions of digital objects, but I think it's the access really that um, is sometimes less than ideal, um, which is precisely why we try to 
set up these projects to increase, enhance access, particularly at a much more granular level. Uh, we really have this limitation. We have cataloged all our journals and so on and so forth at a very top level issue level, but that's not good for someone who's looking at content further down. Um, and so I think that is where we have to do more because that's where the work is still done manually and it's very, very cumbersome. Thank you so much all, all the presenters and audience online and in person for this uh, great conversation and very informative presentations. Uh, now we will have a break for 10 minutes and then we will rejoin for the vendor showcase. Thank you everyone. Thank you.